how intense are the feelings? So this is something that you can do, all of you can do. If you meet, know someone, I hope that we can keep in touch and I can ask you this after you give birth, but how intense are your feelings, okay? And you can't say seven because everybody says seven, all right? <laughs> everybody says seven because they think, okay, well it's good enough and somebody can get off my back, right? But I'm not really there. So you can say everything but seven and ask why, what does that mean for you? Okay, well if I'm a five, maybe five is the best you've had in a week and a half. But what does the five mean? Does that mean that you're not getting your needs met? Does that mean that you're just so exhausted that you just like don't want to do anything? Does a five mean that like, yeah, you're actually feeling pretty good because last week was a two. So ask them, rate them, one to 10. Tell me how you're feeling. How intense are these feelings? Don't give me a seven. And that's something that kind of gives you a gauge too. So that when you, you don't have to ask the question, how are you? And somebody say, what did they say? I'm fine. Now, do you know what fine means? Because I don't know what fine means for you. I don't know what fine means for you. I don't know what fine means for me sometimes. Okay? So thinking about some of those things, give them, ask them to give you a number. So what do you do when you suspect? So facilitate a conversation. How would you talk to somebody who is dealing with anxiety or depression? give you a hint. So the biggest question you can ask is what do you need? Okay. And some people say, I don't know, but we all technically know what we need. It's just a matter of being able to search for that answer. Okay. So what do you need? So Carl, can I pick on you for a second? Come on. Okay. <laughs> I know I can always pick on you. Um, if I asked you what you needed, okay. If you were to take a second to pause, could you name one thing? Yes. A ghost writer to finish his dissertation. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Listen. <laughs> uh, I feel that. <laughs> Been there. Um, but yes, so, okay. But that is something that you need. Um, Soro Curtis Wong, can I pick on you? If I asked you, what do you need? A maid. A maid? Mm -hmm. oh, me too. You've seen that. Um, <laughs> um, I won't be on anybody else, I promise. Um, but that's something that you can ask for somebody because if you even tell them, if they say, I don't know, you can tell them, take 10 seconds, close your eyes. I want everybody to do that. I want you to take a deep breath. And I want you to think of what comes to mind when I ask you, what do you need? when you're ready you can open your eyes and you don't have to share and you may not be okay with sharing and that's okay but being able to pinpoint what you need is the key to being able to do some early intervention okay so when you're asking somebody a new mother or even a pregnant person what do you need you can walk them through that take 10 seconds take a deep breath think about that what's the first thing that comes to mind now granted, they're probably gonna say sleep, right? But you know that one thing you can do, like Basilis said, that you can sit with them, you know, sit with the baby for a couple hours, let them get a shower, let them get a nap, take the kids. Um, even taking the older kids. Um, if there's older kids, I have a, a gaggle of children now, so. Um, <laughs> express concern. So that could be something as simple as, this isn't typical, and I, I try not to say normal, and the reason why I don't say normal is because normal makes it feel like there's supposed to be some sort of baseline that everybody's supposed to get to, and everybody's typical is in that. So this isn't typical of what happens. Yes, this happens in one in five women. Why does it have to happen to you? This isn't typical. So let me try and meet your need. Let's get some help. On what I'm expressing concern, or you don't look the same as you looked last time, mm -hmm. or you sound different, mm -hmm. you're talking slower, you don't sound interested in me anymore. Where's your joy? Um, and ask those pointed questions, right? Because what that does is 
you've given them an outlet to just take a deep breath and go, oh, I don't have to put on a face. Yeah. Sure. Wow, I don't have to fake it anymore. Okay. No, I don't feel great. I'm struggling. Or I'm so exhausted that I don't know what's going on. So expressing concern, educating. You can use the statistic, one in five women have this, right? This is 20% of our population, and at the same time, this is still not typical, and there's help for that. Okay. So it also happens to dads too. Um, I just did a little bit of research on that um, recently, but it happens to one in 10 men. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with witnessing the birth, not feeling useful, um, not getting sleep themselves if they're, they're helping out hopefully. Um, and so this can happen to dads too. So if you are more comfortable talking to the dad, talk to them as well. And then making referrals is necessary. And we'll talk a little bit about databases and on that kind of thing um, where you can find therapists. So opening the conversation. These are some of the questions that you can ask. Don't ask too many consecutive questions. And then your scope, it's a scope of practice. This is partly for clinicians, but um, for your scope of what you know, right? Referring to breastfeeding support or sleep exer, expert or postpartum doula. Um, postpartum doulas are people who will come in and they are hired, but they will come in for several hours. They'll do some light cleaning. They'll take care of the baby, um, those kinds of things. So if you can't particularly do that, maybe that's something that you gift to them uh, as a couple of hours of postpartum support. What not to say? Have you tried? <laughs> Why wouldn't you say that? Because it makes it seem to get bigger. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You tell me that I'm failing, mm -hmm. and I'm trying to figure it out. Yes. Or, you know, or that you haven't done enough yet. Right. So you feel this way, we'll try harder, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, why do you feel like that? Now, this could be a positive question, but in a judgmental tone, in any sort of different type of tone, that could definitely feel judgmental. Oh, I've been there before. Now granted, that can also be a positive, but sometimes people don't wanna hear the, oh, I've been there before, until they know that you are there truly to listen to them. So I would say establish the listening, and then you can relate. And then you can say, hey, you know what? I've, this has happened to me, so you're not alone. So it can go both ways, some of these can. It's not that bad. Please don't say that. Just say <laughs> That's normal. It will pass. No, 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 no. The, the truth is we're never not postpartum once you've had a kid. So, Sora Thompson, you're still postpartum. You're still postpartum, right? So. so. I think I'm going to call them the cause of family. But, but all that to say, what, the point that I want to make though is we see clients that are three, four, five years postpartum and never address the issue. And they're still struggling in parenting because they never addressed it early enough, right? So you're always postpartum and there's always a potential that unresolved depression can still be postpartum depression years later. It's all in your head. Oh no, don't say that. Just calm down. Now, I think a lot of times this is done with good intent. Um, and at the same time, when someone is anxious and someone is panicking, if they could just calm down, they would have already. <laughs> so breathe, take a minute. I'm right here, I'm not leaving you. It's all the things that we would wanna tell our children, right? If we were telling a small child, I'm right here, I'm holding your hand. I'm not going anywhere. You're safe. Take a breath, tell me what's going on, and being understanding, that tone of voice, that it's the impact of what you're saying. Um, and then once you get blank, it'll get better. Not necessarily. Therapy takes time. Mental health resources take time. Sleep takes time for the body to adjust back. So guaranteeing that then sets an expectation that they should be having some sort of quick recovery and that potentially sets them up for failure because then they could go back into that depression because the expectations are high and if they are not met, that could be really difficult. So validating, these are validating words. 
It holds so much power. I hear you. Thank you for sharing with me. You've been through so much. You're brave, you're strong, using all those positive words, giving them, you're a good mom, you're a good parent, you're a good dad. I'm proud of you. You're doing hard work. This is not easy. Um, now it says don't share your story. Now grant, again, this is one of those things that can be positive or negative, but establish listening before you share. Because you really, they want to be heard. We all want to be heard, right? But when we're struggling, a lot of times we struggle in silence because we don't feel like nobody, anybody's gonna hear us. And so even when we're sometimes screaming into the void, it doesn't mean that somebody's hearing us. So listen first and then share if they, if they want you to share. Um, don't offer stories about happy or sad endings. Try not to offer stories about birth trauma, please. Um, because that's scary for a pregnant person. Um, but it also, if you offer happy or sad endings, again, it sets up those expectations, right? Even expectations that things won't work out, things that do get harder, that can be an expectation that can continue the depression. Uh, don't offer solutions. We talked about this a little bit. Um, ask what has and has not worked. And then you can make rec recommendations. So, um, there's a couple of databases, and I didn't put them on here, and I'm happy to send them out. Um, but there's a couple of databases for support. Um, Postpartum Support International, um, the website is postpartum.net. Um, they have plenty of resources. They have support groups all over the nation. They're online and they're free. Um, there's actually a database um, of a representative from every major county in the United States. And if you call that representative and tell them what you need, you need insurance, you need a religious-based counselor, you need um, a low-cost counseling, you need somebody to take Medicaid, you need somebody in person, online, etc. cetera. Um, anywhere in the United States, they will find that person for you. Um, so it's very, very good resource. Um, of course, I, I do this work, and that's not to advertise things, but I do want to show you some of the materials that I've given. If you don't have any materials, please let me know. They may not have any. Okay. So this um, side with the Y Seek Help, it's just a little bit of the statistics that you can take with you. Like I said, facilitating that conversation and normalizing the mental health struggle, that it's not typical, but it does happen and that they're not alone. And then this one is the one I really want to highlight, is the how to help someone who's given birth. And as much as I say who's given birth, I do mean dads too. I do mean partners too. Um, this is really important to have those conversations. But I want to remind you too that perinatal is trying to conceive pregnancy after birth, after a loss, after stillbirth, and parenting. So when you think about this, this can also apply to lost moms too and stillbirth. Please don't forget them because they've given birth just as much as everyone else. They just didn't bring home a baby. For grief. Um, so one, like I've been saying, ask the hard questions. And you can ask on the scale of one to ten, how do you usually feel? Um, instead of asking how you can help, offer something helpful. If you take that initiative, then it takes the guesswork that they have to figure out what they need. So I'm bringing a meal today, <laughs> or I'm going to come and clean your house. You don't even have to talk to me. I'm coming clean. Don't worry about it. Uh, my mother-in-law came and said, I'm coming to fold all your laundry. I said, okay, great. Well, I have a whole bunch of loads, and I'm going to keep doing laundry. <laughs> so <laughs> she folded like seven or eight loads. It was awesome. Um, so <laughs> offer to watch the kids or the baby to give them rest. Don't forget the older kids. Um, that's super, super important. I can't stress that enough because we may feel bonded with baby, and I put myself in that category, but the older kids may, with all of their questions and all of their touching and hands and Mommy, 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 may be really overwhelming. And so taking the older kids may be really helpful. Um, and then normalize the struggle. It's okay not to be okay, but normalize that therapy is positive, helpful. It can happen. I know that there is a lot of stigma 